centered around the self-driving car. Uh, so we use our competence in image and video processing and also point cloud analysis to create a three-dimensional, high-precision, centimeter-level accuracy map from the whole world so that automatic car can drive through it. And this map is available at global scale and is pair with the model surroundings, which you will see, because GPS is not enough to localize the car when does it in such map. And to make it global, we also need some automatic detection of features so that we need to search our job to, to write such kind of algorithm. But the most interesting part of our job is probably the localization. This is our patent, road DNA, a set of two-dimensional depth maps on both sides of the road so that when the car comes and it uses its own sensors to compare with the map and it is able to precisely localize itself without that, with that map. So on a daily basis we are working on the car to drive itself safely, comfortably and precisely. The problem with the cars, however, is that they don't fly. And we think that flying is awesome. Everybody wants to get high. So today we will talk about flying. And the agenda for this presentation is very simple. First, we will talk about a small project for five minutes, then we'll talk about a big project for, for 35 minutes. So it all started by a total competition uh, in which the aim was to follow a running person with the drone automatically and uh, TomTom sponsored the drone for each team and the finals took place in Amsterdam, a city famous for the fact that you can absolutely legally visit Windmills. Again, the vision of flying was growing strong in us. We were expecting this to be a story about pure success, a story about conquering the skies, the story about flying into the unknown and reaching the stars. And we were almost right. This was a story about fighting, a story about constant irritation, the story about struggling, about constant falling and rising from your knees, the story about determination and desperation. We are professionals, and as professionals, we know that in order to start, you need to have a nice plan. Okay? So you start with buying the drone. You open the box, you learn to fly manually, then you gather some characteristics, and then you go with the testing and developing incrementally. You all know that. But we are also enthusiasts. And as enthusiasts, we started with the final design. <laughs> then we moved, and we bought all the electronics that came into our head, and then we bought the drone. We rushed with the developments, and it was going really great after celebrating the first successful uh, code, we finally decided to open the box. The drone was inside, so we put all the electronics that uh, we had, and we gloriously went for the first test in the field, which turned to be the last test for the drone. With the next drone, we learned to fly manually, and then we continued with almost professional approach. So our system was based on Parrot, iron 2, and there's plenty of uh, open source in the web that you can find for that drone, and what we used was Yadrone. You can download it, it's under Apache 2 license, so you can use it freely. And the things that we really like about it, that it promised to easily control the drone. Here we can, for example, see a function move, which is most important here. You can just uh, set the angles and speed of the drop, and that's it, and you can play with that. It also said it's in Java, it's 100% and it's pure. It also supports Android, maybe not 100% and not pure, and we have the video, but with the video we managed and we will tell you how we did that later. So the basic concept of the system, there was a drone and a runner, who, from the point of the view of the system, was just a mobile phone. And we wanted to follow, the drone was to follow the runner, and we had the GPS, so first localization was based on GPS, and then to make precise distance measurement, we used Bluetooth 5 beacon, and finally, to find the proper angle, 
we use tracking from the camera. So after these three calculations, we had uh, almost quite precise position in there. So from the mobile phone, we could send orders to the drone to turn and accelerate so that we have found ourselves in the nice position to, to make the video. So basically, the system is a mobile phone application, uh, which is listening to the drone over Wi-Fi, and uh, it compares its state with the own state of the runner, and then sends back the uh, commands to the drone. Another part of this is the safety officer application. This is an application for another mobile phone for external person who is uh, in any time is able to kick down the drone in case it wants to kill the runner. So now three seconds to look at the diagrams that now. Sorry, deadlines. Yeah. We are anxious about graphical user interface. It needs to be nice and simple. There was no time for fault, so we chose just simple. There are buttons for manual control of the drone and the button to start autonomous function. That's it. On the other hand, there is a safety officer application, which uh, graphical user interface is very similar. With one exception, the autonomous mode function does not work. So beautiful or not, our system works. It worked in Amsterdam during the finals. And our enthusiasm and also lack of skills in dealing with this flying piece of hardware cost us lives of three drones, one injury, and countless loss in equipment. But with the last remaining drone, we managed to follow the runner for the entire track, which was a reasonable achievement. However, we don't like reasonable achievements. What we prefer are extraordinary achievements. So, with the jar of the remaining drone, we create the drone of the last chance. The new home to fulfill our sick ambitions. And these ambitions are to create a map using the drone photo camera, localize the drone on this map, and then use this map for high level order, high level orders. Like, uh, please bring me my glass of water. Thank you. So we will talk about this, uh, these issues and uh, with a little bit of algorithmic introduction, but it's mostly on the show. So after the first few weeks, we managed to get the camera uh, image, camera from the, from the drone, and we put some books on the floor of our office building, and we were flying over that and recording the film, and then we had some frames. And from these frames, we wrote a simple job application to have all these frames go to them, you can see. And then after closing a frame, you find a frame which is right, you can add it to the map manually and continue shifting. And you can see that the map is now below, used by blending, and you can shift, rotate, zoom in, zoom out, until you find that position, and you go to all of the frames, and this way you create the map. This is a manual process. This is our first application, just to do that it's working. And uh, in the beginning, the map looked like that. Uh, which was not uh, the, the smooth enough, so we worked on the smoothing process. After some time, it will be better and better. So how we did that? So this is a diagram of a block drone flying over some high objects, and each dot shows the place where the frame was taken, and each frame captures a limited angle view what is below. And since the drone does not know how high are the objects below, the frame that it produces is at a different perspective than any other frame, so it's not consistent with other frames and not consistent with the map. The only place which is consistent with the top view map is exactly the place below the drone, so the center, usually, the center pixel of the image. And, uh, so what we did, we create a mask, which is one at the center, and it goes smoothly to zero at the edges, and then when we add a frame to the map, we simply do the weighted averaging with the mask. Uh, and then we, 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 we have the smooth map uh, and we accumulate the mask in the map so that the next frame when they come, they are able to be smoothly incorporated into that map. Uh, so after that, we were able to create a nice smooth map manually. Uh, of course, it was a long time to create such maps, so we decided to start automation. And, and in the beginning, this was uh, 
uh, a brute force algorithm to go through all of the frames, all the possible frames, and check the cross correlation where it might be. So, if we have one frame, we said that the next frame, the previ uh, previous frame, the, the ne next frame will be somewhere close to the frame, only limited by the drone movement. So, if we say that the drone during one second can move three meters and can turn by 90 degrees and change altitude by one meter, if we assume like that, that we want accuracy of about one pixel, it would mean that we would need quick calculations to show that the brute force that would need hundreds of thousands of correlations to find the next frame where it is. And in real time, it would be millions of operations, which for operation in real time on the mobile phone is exactly too much. So we have to choose wisely the positions where we correlate, not everywhere, but only on some places. And then we need to correlate fast. So how to be wise, I will tell you right now. Now Quasha will tell you how to be fast. <coughs> Okay, as Christoph said, uh, we had to be really fast, and my goal was here to, uh, to localize frame captured by the drone camera in the map that is continuously updated. So this frame is the map. So by uh, localization, we also assign confidence to each possible location that this is the correct one. And what is important, confidence must be smooth, which means that when we uh, go away from the correct solution, uh, confidence should increase, uh, and it should be increased when coming. And with that assumption, uh, we have one question. If we can achieve that with real-time performance, which will be with some reductions uh, by uh, Christoph, 2,000 transformation per second. And the first uh, trial was a very simple uh, solution with template matching, which is basically uh, iterating over pixels and summing product values of pixel values inside the overlapping area between the frame and uh, the map. And unfortunately, with that simple solution, we can only do 100 locations per second in Austria. Um, so, another try. Uh, it's marked this time. So, we wanted not to process all frames, but only the edges. So, we use the edge base stars. And the idea is uh, quite simple. We just detect edges in the frame. That the edges in the map and check how close they are. Uh, so we just uh, read or can calculate the distance between edge pixels and the closest edges and some of uh, The question here, uh, the question is how to efficiently calculate the distance between particular edge pixels in the closest edge. And So we need to pre-calculate all possible uh, distances, creating something which is called edge, uh, edge distance map. So this map contains the edge pixel distance to the closest edge to the And if we do want to check the correlation, we just put the edge of the frame, uh, either I don't care about the pixels, and just really pre-calculate the values applying behind this. Uh, reading uh, 
So now you know you're not in a small lakeside, you're sure somewhere on the coast. So you have taken observation and you continue walking. And you walk and then you make another observation. You see two soldiers guarding your passage. So you know immediately you are at the border. So you can update your observation. So now only the spots that are on the border remain with some probability, all of the other probability is zero. So you decide to turn around because the soldiers have guns and you, they seem unfriendly and you walk with the sea on the right hand side and then you are able to make your final observation. Uh, you see the tourist, you look at him carefully and you know immediately you are in Poland. <laughs> so what was happening here, this was part of the filtering part, a very simple uh, description. So what, what we have is our state. We want to know, we don't know it directly. We, we, we want to know our position, velocity, orientation. We want to know this, but we don't have that. What we have is a previous view about our state. We know where we were previously. Maybe it is totally random because we were not sure before, but we knew something. And we represent it as particles, as dots, where we think we might be. The denser the particle cloud, the more probable we are somewhere there. And then what we also have, from the last moment that we were, we know our control. We were maybe counting our steps, maybe we were thinking how we are going, so we know more or less how far we were. And we apply it to every particle that we were previously, creating a new point cloud of particles. And then what we also have, we can, for each particle, we can correlate it with our observation. So only the places that correlate well with that observation, that are possible that this observation might be there, will be of high probability, the rest will be zero, or small. And we will repopulate according to that probability, a new cloud creating our actual belief. And this will be continuous. So this is particle filtering. We could talk hours about that. But what is nice about particle filtering is its properties. So we don't need, we, normally we have to, in other approaches, uh, assess our state by some linear function like Gaussian or so, uh, which is not always true because we might be in several places, there are so many hypotheses, and particle filtering is able to do that perfectly. Also, we have scalability. If we have a mobile phone with very low processing power, we can use several samples, the quality will be a bit worse of the localization, but it will be possible. If we have more processing power, we can add particles, that's simple. And finally, there is a recovery mechanism. So, if we get lost, if our particles will converge because of failure to some different places, we can still go back to the actual place because we can add some random samples, random particles all, all over the place and we'll be able to recover. So this is a very nice uh, property of this algorithm. Uh, implementing particle filtering is very simple. There's a lot of code in the internet. What is difficult is design of the state and of the noises of the sensors and of the state. Our model of the state was position of the drone, velocity, rotation, and zoom. Our control was acceleration from the accelerometer and rotation and height also from the sensors. And the measurement was just a frame. So we already talked about the measurement. Uh, you told you how to make, uh, how to find the correlation between the map and the frame. Now let's talk a few words about control. It might be, ob it might seem obvious, but it is not. For example, acceleration. So the drone, in fact, is controlled by angle. So if you bend the drone backwards, it will start to gain acceleration forward, and it will start to move in a positive direction. But now, if you compare the acceleration that you get from the drone with the real acceleration that you uh, measure somehow externally, you see it has absolutely no sense. And it obviously has no sense because what we want to have is the acceleration of the drone in x and y direction, while what we have from accelerometers is the acceleration in the drone reference system. But then we have this angle. So it should be just a matter of cosine, cosine, simple trigonometry. However, the gravity is there. And it is huge. And even the smallest error in the pitch and roll angle, and the gravity will leap to the horizontal axis, and it will be dramatic. So the problem is that the pitch and roll sensor in this drone were very cheap. 
and they suffer from signaling the error. In order to fix that, we were performing calibration. So we were hovering in, in steady state for several seconds, 10 or 20 seconds, and we knew that during this time, these angles should be zero. They were not, so we had drift. And we subtracted that drift from this failing sensor, and then we had a nice uh, roller bridge, and we could use that to calculate that level acceleration. However, the accelerometer sensor in this drop was very cheap, and it suffered from significant error. So also here there was a drift, which we had to use the same buffer to recalculate the drift of the acceleration, subtract it again, and then we had the level acceleration. Very simple. So having this, this drift, we were able to continue flying uh, online. As you can see, it has much more sense now, but there is still some statistical error. It's quite significant in some places. It's, it's up to half a millimeter per second squared. It's quite a lot. Uh, what is also the problem is the lag. So what we, there's, there's a lag between what we see from the camera and the accelerometers. And the lags are killers for the vehicles. It is better to say we don't know the control than to say we have measured the control but underestimate the noise. So if you are faced with the problem that you probably will underestimate the noise, you have to exaggerate it. We did that and it worked. There is a separate discussion that will be needed for orientation, for height, for the sensor, and for the point of acceleration and position. There is not too much time for that. Uh, there's also not too much time for the uh, architecture of our system, which is quite for controlling the drone, making visualization, making logs. Uh, there's quite a few threads there, and there's a state machine inside. But uh, what's the most interesting is probably that behind the interfaces, the control interfaces, we have the real drone implementation to go in the field and fly and to make the videos, mapping, and so on. But Behind the same purpose, we we'll also have a simulator implementation which uses the logs and the videos recorded and can replay uh, later the flights that we did, which is very good because if you uh, work on <coughs> real time debugging of hardware the flying machine, this is really, really, really hard. And this system made it possible, reproducible, and fast. So, you know more or less our algorithms, you know our methods and we know also our inspiration. <coughs> now, let's start. So this is the video of our prototype, desktop prototype. So you see here the keyboard to control the drone. In the upper right you can see the camera, external camera which is uh, recording the event. And this is the, uh, the drone bottom camera. You can see what the drone is here. Here will be the map. It is not here because we are still calibrating. And it will be stretched a little bit because we don't keep the aspect ratio. But you can see it is a problem. You can see particles here. So this is from the world position from the bottom. Maybe the lens is the position. Yes. So we will start to move forward into the fog of war. And we are mapping. You can see that every time we are on some place, we change the perspective because we have a better perspective on that, so with blending, we are improving our map every time we fly on that. Our own or some, some text. In a second, this, 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 this external filming camera will change to the, to the drone forward facing camera. But this is just for, for, for fun. And you can see our friends working in the office after 10 p.m. We were also here after 10 p.m., but we were there legally. Because we have permission, we got spotted behind, behind the wall. So, a romantic night in Tom Tom, we was it, and the drop. So now, you, in a second, you will see a very nice uh, place because you will be uh, flying over a high object. It was captured from a side perspective, now it will be captured from a top perspective, so the map will update. The better perspective it has, it will update because of blending of the center perspective of the time. So this is more or less, what we did, this is the, our main objective, we wanted to do that, we were very happy about this, we wanted to finish here, but we did it. What's more, because we, we have map, we know our position on that map, so why not tell the map 
where the target is, and make the map of the rotated orbit, not you. So like command and conquer. You play, command and conquer. You click, and the drone will go itself. You don't need to steer. So this is what we wanted to do. Uh, so the map will say, OK, I want to go there, and it will calculate what controls it need to apply to make us closer to that step. Of course, we don't have our step. We have our particles. But what we can do, we can apply this to all of the particles and apply the result to the drone. We did that. So in the next video, you will see another mission. The drone will wake up not knowing where it is. It will have a map, but it will not know where it is. And during the first few seconds, it will try to localize the view using particle filtering. So the drone will finally converge to the place where it has quite confidence on the map. And then the map will take over the control and it will go to target one, pick up the cargo, then go to target two and land with the cargo. Uh, the pickup mission will be done manually uh, because this is a feasibility. All, all of the stuff will, will, will mostly be done uh, by, the, by the map and the drone. So the video starts here. There's a bigger lag between the cameras now because we use the bottom camera, which is so in the after calibration, you will see soon the particles all over the map, which will converge finally to the place where we are. And after, yeah, you can see that. There's some lags, but after some time, you will know where we are. Uh, and when we are, when we have confidence, the map will take control, and we go to target automatically to target one. No lags, but steadily, we finally go to our place. Yes, and now the manual control takes over. So the user, myself, is going to pick up the drone. The technology for the pickup is very interesting. It's a magnet hanging on a sticky tape. And the magnet goes into pendulum motion sometimes, obstructing the height sensor of the drone. So sometimes the drone misjudges how high it is. You will see later how the drone needs to that. It's very interesting. But now, let's focus on the pickup mission which you have to trust me needs a lot of patience. Okay. Are you ready? Okay, we are almost ready. So pick up. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> now, the room. <laughs> Means judgment. <laughs> but we are going steadily towards target. No, we are very close. We are landing. No. We are landing. No. And. <laughs> Miss judgment again. <laughs> this is very sad. Very bad. Conclusions. We broke the glass. We broke the drone. We displaced the ceiling. <laughs> But we managed to localize ourselves. We went to target one. We picked up a cargo. We went to target two. Maybe not smoothly and not precisely, but we delivered the cargo to the ground. <laughs> so <coughs> that's another milestone that we got. We were very happy about that. And no, probably when you were coming here, we were, we were expecting to see something like this because of the title of the presentation. Uh, but what I'm going to show you now will be a little bit off topic, but you haven't expected that for sure. Because what I'm going to show you now is a toilet idea. The toilet idea is when you go to the toilet and you have an idea. Okay. My toilet idea was about blending. So I told you that we use a center perspective so that we have a mask, so that for, if you apply this mask to all of the frames, in the center, center perspective, we will have a nice top view of the of the Now, what if I intentionally change the center perspective to a different perspective at the side and apply it to every frame? What we will get will be a layer of the map which is which pers a different perspective, a side perspective. And if we create such layer for different perspectives, we will be able to play with a lot of perspectives from different points of view of the drone. So what will be possible? In the simplest case, we will just use the center perspective to say we are infinitely far away, so everything is a top view. But then we will be able to zoom in and play with all of the perspectives to create a virtual view in this place. 
So using some perspectives, we will take the left, some from the right, and then we will create a virtual perspective. This no, no, notice, the drone was never here. We will create this virtual view out of all the other places it was here. Okay? Right there. So we decided to implement that. The problem was that it needed a really precise localization, which part of the footage was not enough. And it was very sensitive to pitch and roll. Uh, so we at least, it was very, a, a lot of uh, development, which we didn't have time for, but at least we wanted to prove feasibility on that, on that. So we moved our toilet idea to the kitchen. And in the kitchen, we prepared, prepared a laboratory setup. There is a ribbon hanging over the scene. And this is for reference height. We are manually taking photos and to keep the, the nice kitchen roll, just to check if it will work. The ribbon, very important, is attached at one side to the kettle and on the other side the microwave oven supported by me. Using that setup, we created 11 perspectives of the map. This is the second perspective and the extreme perspective you can also see here. And then we used the magical blend. So with the standard approach, while zooming in and out, you would never know that below the chair there is a spider in the magazine which can clearly see when zooming in with our 3D map browser. With our 3D map browser, the drone sees perspectives about which it hasn't even dreamed about. 3D browsing, zooming in, zooming out is possible. We are aware that there are literature approaches with structure from motion, sophisticated methods with uh, optical flow and so on. But our approach needs no signal processing, no image processing at all. Just simple blending. And to our knowledge, no one has ever done it before. So we are fine. Which is a sum of what I was talking about. I talked about autonomous follow up mode, mode for the drone, about mapping localization, <coughs> map based control using the drone and the mobile phone. All available in 3D. I hope uh, you will find this presentation useful, at least in the, in the case that all of you very overly enthusiastic about working with flying hardware. It will be a warning or a discouragement. For the rest of you, crazy nerds, let it be mobilization. So, for us, it was a hard time. We were very tired, it took us a long time, but considering these moments when we felt pure creation, 